So welcome back. Now, everybody have a nice journey. Understand the steps. Step one, the meditative faculty, going into quiet mind, the breathing technique, mantra, whatever is useful. Going into deep silenceness, intending to see, then going and allowing your mind to know, affirming that it can know and see any place it wishes. And if you become distracted or feel you're forcing it, stop the remote viewing process and just go back to meditating and then allow it to unfold again organically, naturally, effortlessly and do this back and forth. Now you can spend an hour doing this. Obviously we're, we're not going to spend an hour. And as you do this, begin to make a note of how it felt when you got something that was a perception. And as I share what it actually is, because I live there, I know what it looks like. We're not remote viewing the dark side of the moon. Begin to take note. You want to do a critical deconstruction of what you got that was accurate and what wasn't, and how did it feel when the accurate part of the remote view was coming, and what were you doing when the inaccurate, when you got off the target? You see what I'm saying? So you want to do a post-game wrap-up here. <laughs> You want to do a, a, a review of it so you begin to learn how your mind works and how your consciousness operates because everyone is different. I want to point out that some people will just know. Other people will feel. Some people will actually see. Other people who are very verbal will actually get words and see words that describe it. It's all different because everyone is a unique creation. No two, not even identical twins are the same. Not even clones. So <laughs> I have a twin sister. It's funny, I had a PhD once ask me, does that mean you're identical? And I went, well, there's one tiny difference. Well, not tiny. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> okay, so I know I'm outrageous. I like doing deep consciousness, spiritual things, and then putting something off color and baldy so it wakes people up. <laughs> not tiny. So the, the house, so we're in the Blue Ridge Mountains, um, and we're about 20 miles west of Charlottesville, University of Virginia, a little less, as a crow fl flies, maybe 14 miles, and these UFO goes. And it's about 65 acres, and as you approach the property, there are a set of black gates that are electronically controlled to control access. Obviously, I mean, I have to live that way. And then as you come up the driveway, there's a, a black paved driveway that comes up and then it becomes that brown crushed estate stone, it's really pretty, uh, around the house. And there's a circular driveway in front. The house is a two-story Georgian with a third floor with um, dormers and two wings off on either side, symmetrical. Um, and it's made out of hand-pressed brick, so you see little fingerprints in it. Um, and then to the left is a garage complex um, that's not attached to the house. And then the two doggies, <laughs> uh, the black, there's a black female who is uh, named Rosie, and she is, um, they're both rescues. One is, she is half pit bull and half black lab, and full of energy and love and happiness. All she wants to do is sit in your lap and kiss you and lick you. <laughs> Now, she looks scary as a guard doll, but she actually all she wants to do is sit in your lap and hug and kiss you all day. And then there's another dog who's quite old. He's about 15 years old that we rescued, and he's half chow and half German shepherd. Very handsome face, kind of reddish brown, and a kind of a mane, uh, a much lo a longer fur, but not real long, but fluffy because it's cold in Virginia now, and he fluffs up because uh, they're outside dogs. And... Um, and the pit bull is very short-haired black. Um, and uh, just, the, 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 uh, just sort of the quintessence of loving loyalty. And he is very noble and loving. And when you pet him, to give you an idea of his personality, if you stop, 
he just puts one paw on your shoulder very politely as if to say, please pet me some more. Now, the black lab pit bull female just wiggles so much she just jumps in your she can't control herself in joy and happy she just bursts with happiness so very different personalities um, and if you went in did anyone go into the house you I mean you had my permission I mean it's, we have a, a lower level the vault uh, and then the the first level and the the, the center hall the marble floor and then to, as you go into the right is a living room that has a desk where I work that overlooks this 100 mile view of the Blue Ridge, beautiful. And then a guest wing and an office where my wife works um, adjacent to the living room going west and towards the view. And then from the center hall straight ahead is a library which, with cherry paneling with a zillion books. And then to the left of the center hall is um, a dining room uh, with a altar in it, uh, and then and then adjacent to that is a butler's pantry and a kitchen with a really high ceiling, great big kitchen. My wife likes to cook. And then also in the living room on the north side, which would be the entry side of the main, the front entrance, which we never use, we always come in the kitchen door to the east, uh, is a um, an altar, Chinese altar, where I keep the puja and artifacts from all over the world and things that have been given to me um, from uh, temples in Japan and all kinds of things. Uh, and the house is filled with all kinds of eclectic um, sort of things we've collected over the years. Um, and then the land going uh, behind the house, there's, uh, there are meadows all around. And on the back, as you're facing the house to the going in and to the left, there's a giant uh, solar array. It's the largest legal solar farm in Virginia uh, that runs the estate. Um, until I get a ZPE, that's the best you can do. 15% efficiency, not great, but I mean, we have it. And, um, and then there are woods, and then there's a clearing and a stream and a huge, the lower 40, <laughs> and then uh, another set of woods and a hill, and that's the, we have about 65 acres there. So I don't know how much of that that clipped into your mind. Uh, I, I wanted to share quickly. So did any people, how many people got some part of that that seemed pretty accurate or surprisingly accurate? Yeah, I mean, you see about half or two thirds. So when we do this in a small group, people go, we go in a circle and people share. Or you can actually write it out on a piece of paper and, and then have it reviewed. The key thing to do also when you're doing this at home, you can do this at home, is to do is is to to go back and forth sharing having different people share things the others don't know but also when the people begin to share go to that person and hit, listen with, without judgment what they're saying and just feel your truthometer your truth meter is this correct or not correct and then continue to remote view even as they're sharing you see what I mean? So even the checking in and checking out process becomes an iterative back and forth way of learning where you're continuing to do the remote viewing and sensing an intuitive awakening. Does this make sense to folks? Yeah? Okay, so that's just one exercise. Uh, th there are hundreds of approaches. These are ones that I found over the years are fun to do. Um, I can't wait to get one of these um, random number generator lamps or lights so that we can put it in front and do it and make it turn different colors. And that we're going to be getting one of those fairly soon. Um, uh, and as a consciousness assisted technology test. But this is a more sophisticated level because this is actually what you're doing when you're making contact with these interstellar civilizations. You're wanting to see where they're from, what planet is it, what does their spacecraft look like, what sector of space will they be coming in from. For example, often we'll do this as a team, you know, these week long expeditions, which, you know, they're limited now to about 25 people because. I used to let 60 people come out, and it was just such a, too much for me to handle, and it was too hard to get coherence in a team that big. Um, but when now we're going out with just like 25 people and me and, and folks, and you know, if you guys want to come, just sign up for one, but you know, you got to sign up fast, because usually they, sign, they fill up in a, day, a couple of days. But we're going to um, do one in Arizona in May, and uh, 
what I'd like for people to understand about this is that when you're doing this at home, if you live in Vancouver or Japan or Mexico, wherever you're from, you can do the contact protocol before you go out as a group. So each individual member can do the meditation, tell the interstellar ETs where you're going to be and when in advance. And then also, however, go into sort of this quiet, after you meditate, maybe lay down and go into a hypnagogic state, that space between waking and dreaming, and ask them to show you how they're going to show up, what time, and where. The first time we went to Mexico to go to um, the volcano, Popo, Popo Catapeto, I can never pronounce Is that halfway decent? I, said, I just call it Popo. One time I gave a lecture in, in Mexico and I was so embarrassed. I'm terrible with this sort of thing. I just would, popo go grande, boom. And everyone understood. Anyway, it's terrible. My mother was a Spanish translator too. You think I would have learned a little bit. But I know, un, un poquito. <laughs> Solamente. I always tell people, mi es muy estupido. Mi, mi madre es profesor español. <laughs> Not my forte. So anyway, um, I know Sanskrit and a few things. I don't know other languages very well. Uh, that's why God created translators. Anyway, so it, when we were there, the exactly seven days to the hour adjusted for time zones, I had a meditation and saw this massive transdimensional triangular craft coming out of this volcano. And I, I saw where we were, I saw, I saw exactly what the landscape was, everything about it. And so when my team went there, we spent the first two days driving around little towns, and finally we ended up um, on the other side of the volcano. The first night we were at a place, and I kept, I was, we were doing, and I kept getting incorrect, 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 not here, incorrect. And so we, the next day we were going through all these little towns and, the people were wonderful. Now, the federales robbed me. They came at gunpoint in broad daylight as soon as we left the airport, took our passports and all our money, and the only way we got, we had to give them all our money to get our passports back. It was four in the afternoon. It was pretty scary. So, ugh, now I don't go anymore unless I have a, a Secret Service level sag wagon to, you know, protect. But th this is the first time I went. And that we were going along, and we finally find an outside Puebla, and then there's this little town, Metepec, and then Atli Mayaya. It's a little teeny village. It's like at the end of the road uh, before you get to the jungle, right, the, uh, the volcano. This is 18,000 foot, I believe. Uh, one, I think it's the fourth highest volcano in the world. Beautiful. And when we got there, and there was a field to outside Atli Mayaya. And when we got there, I said, this is it. And that night, interestingly, in the, the, uh, the week before, the moon was in a certain phase, and that night it was in that phase. Uh, the stars were in a certain way. It was that crystal clear and accurate. And I said, this is where we have to be. And then this massive uh, object comes out from the volcano and floats towards us, and we're connecting to it, and the beings on board, the commander, the, the, is connecting and communicating with us telepathically. And all of our equipment is, it, electronics are going crazy. We had a camera, and the camera just went whoo, electromagnetically, just melted down, shut down. And it came around, and it came towards us. And we, so I had, at that time, I didn't have these interesting lasers, so I just had these lights, and I'd signal to it, and it signaled back. And it came over and turned, and then actually went between Atli Mayaya and, and down where Puebla is. And as it was going down, it went back into the earth. It did one more signal to us in sequence with what I was signaling, and, and, the, and the commander said goodbye. And it went, it was a beautiful, now this all unfolded. I mean, it's like something, <laughs> it'd be great to do a full length feature movie in Hollywood about the real things that happened with CE5s. But that was all precognitively seen in a lucid kind of state after meditation. It was actually after sleep and in meditation going in and out of that hypnagogic or hypnopogic is a state, the, the space between dreaming, waking, 
and sleeping is that relaxed state but and it just came in in an instant an absolute instant it didn't it wasn't like it took a, it took a maybe half a second for the whole packet of vision to come and almost every time we've had a significant ce5 has happened that way you you all have heard of the phoenix lights have how many people have heard of that, the thing that, well, most people. You know, in 1997, the Phoenix Lights event happened in Phoenix, all over Arizona, really. And I was there when it happened in March. Uh, we were uh, using a digital lab uh, that was actually tied into a covert program, um, but they were letting me use it. And the, a picture editor for the BBC was flown in to help me put together this reel of images I've been showing you. And we were doing it to give to members of Congress for the April 1997 briefings in Washington that we were doing for Congress. And so while we're there, while I'm flying in, I'm sitting in my seat and I'm on a US Airways, I called it US Scareways flight, a US Airways flight, they're now part of American, and we're, we're flying in and I decided to do the CE5 protocols. And I was told to ask the ETs, so I asked the ETs to do something while I was there that would be unmistakable that we could get to put on this reel, this video, to give the members of Congress. That was at 5.30 p.m. At 8.30 p.m., the Phoenix Lights happened as a CE5. It was a CE5. And the epicenter where it was was right above the lab where I was. And this general, this guy, a former general who, who worked for Evergreen uh, Transport, a whole bunch of spooks and uh, cutouts for the CIA, came running in. He says, you wouldn't believe what's going on out there. And he I said, oh, yeah, I would. And so it was on the news that night, you know, all over in the Phoenix area. Now, of course, once I shared this, the UFO subculture covered it up because they think, you, you know, it's all, you know. UFO, you know, it's like the nuts and bolts crowd of ufology because they don't understand interstellar spacecraft or transdimensional and their craft and everyone on board are wired into this field of unbounded consciousness. So they don't want to hear that there is a way to actually make contact and, and use these techniques, although they'll admit that the military has remote viewing, but we can't use it. I mean, it's, it's, like, it's, so, it's so ridiculous, it's dysfunctional. So, this happened, and it was great because uh, it ended up on the news. We put it on the reel, and we gave it to all these members of Congress. So the Phoenix Lights was an event that was, and I actually saw that event happening that night three hours earlier. It would be interesting to see what a random number generator would have done. By the way, thousands of people saw this. And Dr. Katai, who's a friend of mine, also a medical doctor, um, filmed it, took pictures of it. And uh, later, a couple hours later, the uh, Air Force put up uh, flares and said it was a National Guard thing. Uh, and, and, and Fife Symington, you know, the, the, the governor of Arizona, did a press conference because there were so many thousands of people who saw it and had a, a, a ridiculous looking aide come out dressed up as an alien and made fun of it. Later, he admitted that he himself had seen it and that he was very wrong to have ridiculed it and covered it up. And we have him on videotape. By the way, Michael, that needs to be in this the movie. Um, and so uh, the future the movie was coming out in six or seven months. You all know about that? Ho, ho, boy, it's going to be a thousand times bigger than serious. So that is exactly <laughs> how you do it. So you take these, these techniques that you're learning over last night and today and apply it out in your groups or by yourself for the purpose of making contact, but understand that you can do it in real time under the stars, but you can also do it before you even go out, a week before, a day before, a night before. Because if consciousness, and this I've seen if, it has been proven that consciousness is a non-local field that is omnipresent and transcends the limits and boundaries of space but also time. And that's why you can have a precognitive lucid dream or a remote view of the future. Now let me, a caveat here. If it's not in the now or in the past, the past you can pull things from the Akashic record. And I'll define that, what, I, what the Akashic record really is in a moment. 
But if, if it's in the now, it can be verified. If it's in the future, you can only speak, a wise person will only speak of probabilities. Now, it may be a 95% probability. Only a charlatan and an idiot will say, this is going to happen. You notice all the people make predictions on October 12th, uh, the, 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 the great convergence, and this is going to happen. It never happens. Why? Because they don't understand that by the time they actually put that into the field of consciousness, there's enough that happens that alters the timeline for good or for ill that changes the event horizon. So when you're talking about the future, you can only talk of probable futures. Um, so you have to temper it with a, a, a scintilla of humility, but also common sense and reality. If you're talking about the now, you can get very accurate with the now. And in the past, you can also be very accurate. I have a military advisor who in 1974 was read into, that's military spook speak for briefed, read into a project that was at the White Oaks Naval Facility, it's now closed, where they had developed an electronic device where it can go to any place, like this room, and extract from the, quote, white noise of space-time any speech, event, action, whatever, that had ever happened in that volume of space, going back a year, a minute, a decade, a thousand years, a million years. And this was an electronic system, naval intelligence, and this is 74, so this was about 42 years ago. And um, <laughs> have you all heard of this? Oh well, I mean, this is, I, mean I, I live and breathe and work with these kind of folks all the time, and it's not a myth, it's absolutely real. So electronics, very advanced electron, trans-dimensional electronics. Our tax pay dollars hard at work, I mean, remember, there's trillions of dollars in unacknowledged special access covert programs that have gone into the study of this. So trillions, not billions. There's about a 200 billion a year going. But if you add it up cumulatively from the 50s till now, you're really talking uh, unbelievable trillions, you know, at least eight, 10 trillion dollars. So when, when this is but, but the point I'm making is that in consciousness, if you're adept at practicing meditation, you can also go to a place and feel and sense what has happened in that place in the past. And you can connect to the Native American peoples of this valley. You can, now th let me bring in another layer of high strangeness. So you're, we're out at um, Shasta a few years ago, and we're doing this protocol, suddenly, we're, we, we have an interstellar trans-dimensional object that comes in on a carrier wave of a tone. It's this, to it's this crystalline tone that we record with a you know, lousy, it wasn't even digital, it was a, one of these old tape recorders. And everyone in the circle heard it and when they, with their eyes closed, we were in a deep meditation. It's when I was taking people into the deep God consciousness, Brahman consciousness state. It came in. But everyone saw the, the spacecraft, which is this pearlescent, shimmering sphere that came from one side of the national forest through the center of the circle out the other end. You're going to see some of these pictures tonight. Oh, not that. Um, so... Shortly after that, we were all in such a deep state of consciousness that we opened up a time snap, a bubble, in the area, in that forest, that allowed us to perceive and brought into that dimension, that place, physical 3D, we're sitting on the dirt or on the ground in this national forest, and suddenly there's... <laughs> And there's an ancient pre-homo sapien humanoid that pre-existed in, in the order of many tens of millions of years ago in that area that appeared and then disappeared in the east field to our east. But not ET and not human, but it just came in. 
Am I stretching things too far? Are you following? Okay, so I know it sounds like a science fiction movie, but the, tr the strangest things are true. And everyone heard that and was, oh my God. And then it went on from there. A week under the stars doing this, you cannot imagine what happens. I mean, you cannot. I mean, it's, it's beyond people. How many people have been on one of those week-long expeditions? You know, grab one of them and just tell them, huh, ask them. So that, that's exactly what you want to be able to do with your, your own contact team. Practice these techniques. Go out and do it with a few people. Practice the remote viewing every day, every minute of every day. Be in a mindful state. Develop at least twice to three times a day this practice of deep, quiet meditation, remote viewing practice, and you'll be stunned at how quickly you advance and how much it can then be used to create peaceful interstellar contact. So these sciences that are based in consciousness and the knowledge of the true structure of the multiverse we live in, the trans-dimensional universe we live in, is the foundation for contact and being an ambassador to these civilizations. 